Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come to your throne. Thank you, Father, we have this avenue of prayer. We can take our concerns, our cares before you. Most of all, Father, we take this opportunity to thank you for all the blessings we have of being your children. Thank you for the love that you have for us. Thank you that you sent Jesus here to take our sins to the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Father, by his sacrifice that we have the cleansing of our sins and hope of eternal life someday. We pray, Father, this day for those in our community, those that are suffering in our nation, all around the world, Father. It be your will that some way this virus Maybe a treatment found or a vaccine found for this virus that it might soon end. We pray, Father, that at all things your will be done and not ours. We thank you, Father, for the congregation of people that meet here at Stantonville. We pray we'll always be a loving congregation that look for ways to share the good news of the gospel with those we meet. Pray we uh, show the love of Christ through our lives each day, Father. Help us always to be ready to give an answer for those that we meet, for the hope that we have, the hope that we'd like to share with others. We thank you, Father, for the leaders of our congregation, for the elders, the deacons, the ministers. Thank you for their vision, for their love for you, Father. Pray that you strengthen them during this time. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have even this morning come together and to remember Jesus' sacrifice. We pray as we worship you this day that everything we do will be according to your will, Father. That we might seek out ways to be closer to you each day. Thank you for this way that we have by talking to you. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, allow me to share a few thoughts with you. Anytime we do something regularly and especially frequently, it has the danger of deteriorating into a mere meaningless ritual. We want to carefully avoid that. We take the Lord's Supper every Sunday and therefore it has that potential 
of us allowing it to deteriorate into nothing more than mere ritual, concerned mainly with the outside rather than the inside. Actually, the most important thing about the Lord's Supper is not the mere taking of a bit of unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. That's important and essential. But what's the most important is what that should cause us to think about. We should be thinking about Jesus on the cross. As he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, Do this in remembrance of me. And I think he meant, remember what I've done for you on the cross. The Apostle Paul warns us to not take the Lord's Supper in what he calls an unworthy manner. And then he explains what he meant by that by saying that an unworthy manner would be not discerning, not thinking about, contemplating and visualizing the Lord's bruised and beaten body on the cross. So first of all, I would like to urge us all to be sure that as we take the bread and the fruit of the vine, that we go beyond just that and seriously contemplate Jesus hanging on the cross. The deeper our understanding and feeling about that, the deeper our gratitude will be. Another thought I'd like to share with you is that actually the Lord's Supper should bring mixed emotions. I've just explained that, of course, it brings sadness. It brings a regret that our sins made it necessary for Jesus to go there. But also the Lord's Supper can and should bring joy. Not joy that he had to go to the cross, but rather joy because of the results. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, if we've obeyed the gospel, we have the forgiveness of our sins. They've been washed away by his blood. They've been cast as far as the east is from the west. And that should bring great joy. I think this just might be what the Hebrew writer had in mind when he made the rather strange statement about Jesus and said that who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Of course, there was no joy in the agony of the cross, but no doubt what the Hebrew writer had in mind was the joy that Jesus must have felt in knowing that the result of what he was doing on the cross would make it possible for God to offer salvation to all. And that should bring us joy as well as him. So as we take the bread, I urge you to, as Paul urges us, to be sure to discern, to contemplate, to visualize his bruised, beaten body on the cross. Shall we pray? Father, we're so very, very thankful for the great sacrifice that you made in allowing your one and only Son to come to this earth, to live, to teach, and finally to submit himself to the brutality and the pain and agony of the cross for our sins. As we take this bread, Father, help us to visualize that and be thankful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, again, as we take this fruit of the vine, please help us go far beyond the mere physical outward act of drinking a bit of the fruit of the vine. May, as he said, it cause us to remember 
the blood that he shed from his head to his foot. From the crown of thorns to the brutal beating of the scourging and the nails driven in his hands and feet, maybe remember that that blood washes away our sins and be very thankful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. summer, yeah, I guess it was last July, Matt had asked me, he heads up Horizons, which is a, the big camp we have at Freed Hardeman, which has around a thousand or so students um, that we have come to that, you know, high schoolers um, that come every year. And so those of you that were at Horizons last year, I'm going to apologize now because you've heard this already. So um, Matt asked me to do this lesson on the last night of, of camp um, on a Thursday night. And um, so I studied for it. And after I did the lesson, he said, hey, I'd like for you to do that at Stantonville sometime. I said, well, not anytime soon because we've got kids that go to Horizons that have already heard it once. So um, just go back and find your notes, Jada, from previous, um, from last year, and just pull those up because we'll go over them again. Uh, but for the most of you here, you will have never um, heard this lesson. And um, when he asked me to speak, our topic for the week was Rise Up. That was kind of like the theme for the week of camp um, for these students. The year before it had been broken, and it was talking about just life and how, I guess, how broken many teenagers are. Um, 
dealing with stuff at home with their friends, family, just in life, not knowing what the next step is, next chapter. And so it was about broken. And the second year we did this was called Rise Up. It was about taking a stand in your faith and showing what you believe in your schools. And even though you are broken and you have things going on in your life, you can recover from those with God and trusting in God. And when you do that, you got to be able to stand up and rise up. Um, we as believers and as Christians um, have to rise up. And so as I was kind of going through all that, I, I found, I guess recently in a book, um, I do periodical reading, I guess, of sometimes self-help, motivational books, business books, things like that, things that you know, pertain to my work, but also at times spiritual books. And I was going through some and found this one. Um, and just being honest, I didn't read the book, but I, I didn't buy it. But I saw the cover. The cover caught my eye, and it was this. Um, it was Be the Switch. And it was this idea of pretty much you know, light versus darkness, turning the light switch on, pretty basic stuff. Um, good versus evil, and I kind of glanced through and read the back cover to see what it was about and who the author was, and I ended up not buying it, but I couldn't kind of, the cover just stayed with me, and I couldn't forget about it. But what really stayed with me was the fine print underneath, and it says this, living out your calling while living out your life. And boy, that hit me just deep in the gut, because at that time I was studying for a, this lesson at Horizons last July. And the topic was rise up with purpose and really identifying what really is our purpose and are we doing anything about it? Is it, is it the guiding light for us? Is it the compass for what we are making decisions upon every day as Christians? I'll tell you, living out your calling or living out your life is a difficult thing. Um, oftentimes my life here on this earth, my earthly life collides occasionally with my purpose. But more often than not, my eternal purpose and my earthly purpose are not the same. They're typically on different, different paths, different roads. They're not hand in hand. They're not aligned with each other. And I spoke two weeks ago about John 15, and it says, Abide in me and as I abide in you. And we, it seems easy and seems like it should be natural. But more often than not, they will collide. They'll intersect and they match up every once in a while. But it's very easy to let those two kind of differ and go apart. Um, typically on a Lord's Supper, during the time of the Lord's Supper, and we observe that, um, I always like to read Matthew chapter 27. It's a beautiful description of the death of Jesus on the cross. Um, you all know that um, story. And, and, and during that week of camp, it felt like, it just naturally happened like this, all of the topics that were leading up to mine on Thursday night were all about the crucifixion of Jesus. And it was just over and over again we talked about it, which you should be. It's so powerful, and it means so much to us as Christians because it's why we are all doing this today. Um, and it is why we believe. It is why we have faith through the crucifixion. And so, like, it was all we talked about. And then on Thursday morning, Matt came up to me and was like, hey, I don't know if you've got this incorporated, but you should probably incorporate the resurrection because we've not talked about that at all. And I told him, I was like, you know, honestly, that's more often than not me too in my personal study, like during the Lord's Supper. I typically read Matthew 27, but very rarely do I flip over to Matthew 28. And, and I'm going to kind of incorporate two things. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to spend time in two areas, the book of Acts in chapter 26 and the book of Matthew in chapter 28. That'll be the only two places we are today. Um, and I hope that this will all kind of flow together and make sense to you as to why living out your calling and living out your life incorporates to Matthew 28. So if you will, go ahead to Matthew 28, and we're going to spend some time there where, where Mr. Tim just read from. It says this in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone, and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them, and he said, Greetings. And they came up, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. 
I want to stop right there for a second. I want us to talk about this. I want you to imagine having put yourself, if you can, in the, in the shoes of these two women or the sandals of these two women. They have just seen Jesus hung up on a cross in Matthew 27, and as it described, beaten, mocked, scourged, put the uh, crown of thorns on his head, wearing the purple robe, stabbed with a spear. I want you to imagine all of these horrifying events they have just witnessed. And probably they have witnessed or heard something like it before of people being crucified. But this man Jesus that they follow, that they have given their lives to, and these apostles who believed in him and who he came and found who were unordinary men and asked them to do extraordinary things, they have just seen this. They have been told it's going to happen. It has come true. I want you to imagine the nervousness, the anxiety, the confusion, probably the fear as it's described here, waiting for that third day. And in the moment when these two women are running to the tomb, Scryzim is running there. When they get there, they have a great earthquake. I've never felt an earthquake in my life, but I'm trying to put myself in their shoes, and I hope you do the same. When they get to the tomb, they feel an earthquake. And they see the stone on the tomb has been rolled back, a huge, gigantic stone. And there is an angel who looks like lightning. He's shining so much. His clothes are as white as snow. And he's sitting on top of the stone. Can you imagine the fear and how scared they probably were at that moment, knowing that probably all the things they've been told or heard about or maybe prophesied are starting to come true? And in about a 72-hour time frame, all of this is happening. I'm talking like Monday to Wednesday. We're having every, everything like this is happening. I can only imagine how scared they were. But in these two, Matthew 28 and in Acts chapter 26, I want you to think about this idea of living out your calling while living out your life. As these two women run to the tomb to see Jesus, the first thing the angel says to them is, do not be afraid. And then he says to them later on, for I know that you seek Jesus. You want to talk about living out your calling while living out your life, being the switch, fulfilling, fulfilling your purpose. When these two women approach the tomb to where Jesus had risen from, the resurrection, which is probably the biggest event paired with the crucifixion and all of Christianity, it should be, that these two women are told by an angel from heaven that I know for a fact that you seek Jesus. Oftentimes, it is easy for our purpose here on earth to not align with our purpose that is eternal. But these two women somehow aligned the two perfectly. They were living their life and at the same time living at their calling and seeking Jesus. I want you to skip over to verse 16. We just had read by Mr. Tim. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why in the world does Jesus say all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me to these 11 disciples? Why does he choose those words to preface what he's about to say is probably our life's goal as Christians? This is what I believe. It says that some of them doubted whenever they saw him. I would assume I would do the same. It would probably be surreal to see someone that I know and am very close with, who I know was murdered on a cross, to rise from the dead, even if he had told me word for word he was going to do it, it would still be hard to believe. I can only imagine that these men who were found fishing were grabbed and told to follow me. They left everything they had, followed this man till the end. Some betrayed him. Some ended up killing themselves over that relationship. The disdain, the tearing apart of them together, I can only imagine the fear, the nervousness, how scared, how questioning they were to, to Jesus through this whole time. Time and time again it says that they doubted or they questioned him. and He tested them. But they get to this moment here when they finally see Jesus on the mountain. And it says they worshipped him. I love how it describes the two women. It says that they went to his feet and grabbed hold of his feet. I don't know if you see the connection between what he just did when he washed the disciples' feet just a few days before. But I can only imagine how scared they were and how unsure they were of what the future held. And Jesus chooses to say these words, 
all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I believe he's trying to tell them, look, everything you thought you knew, everything you thought you understood, every type of purpose, goal of life that I have commanded you and taught you up to this point, what I'm about to tell you, I can promise you and guarantee you, it is what everything you need to be doing as a Christian and a disciple and apostle needs to be about. Because all of the authority, nothing anyone else has told you in these past three days matters because what matters is what I'm about to say. Because all the authority has been given to me. And then in verse 19, he gives what I would say is pretty basic, our purpose. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Your purpose shouldn't conflict with God's will. Instead, God's will should be your purpose. I'll say this. I can only imagine whenever they heard these words from Jesus and all that he had commanded them, probably what was going through their mind and thinking like, man, I've seen Jesus heal the sick and heal the lame and he'll sit with the poor and to sit with tax collectors and sinners and love everyone. And he's told us these different commandments time and time and time and time again. And they're running through their mind exactly all that we're supposed to be doing and going to make disciples. And now they're starting to process, well, where am I supposed to go and what am I supposed to do? And stories like Peter, who betrayed Jesus just a few days before, hears these words and goes on to become one of the greatest ministers and missionaries of God's word and of the gospel and spreading the good news. Peter at the time, I believe, before Jesus was crucified, for the most part, gave up everything and followed Jesus. His purpose on earth, what he felt like he was doing in his life or his career, whatever, he left all that behind and he aligned his life and his purpose with God's will. He got to the moment right up until Jesus' crucifixion when he betrays Jesus three times. And in that moment, Peter's earthly, what he viewed as purpose, life on earth, saving himself, protecting himself, his earthly purpose, left and straight aside from his eternal purpose. And they went on different paths for a few moments. But he brought them back together just three days later at Jesus' resurrection when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. Your purpose shouldn't conflict with God's will, but God's will should be your purpose. And we're going to spend the most of our time, and we'll come back to Matthew 28, is Acts chapter 26. And I want us to flip there very quickly. I want to set the stage for you as best that I can. You've probably seen a movie about judges and lawyers and juries and all these things. And you can see the setting where the man is sitting before in the movie where he's sitting up at the front desk in front of the judge. And he's sitting by his lawyer, and his lawyer gets up and says, okay, I'm here to defend the defendant. I'm going to make my plea. I'm going to prove the innocence, the truth of this man. And you have those moments in the movies where it's like very dramatic. And the defendant says, no, I'm over this lawyer. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's not telling the truth. I'm going to defend myself to the judge. Paul, who we know in Acts chapter 9, has just went through a crazy conversion, one of the more beautiful stories of people changing their lives to be with Jesus. And to follow God. This story of Paul in Acts chapter 9 when he's walking on the road to Damascus to go and kill more Christians as Saul. He stopped and blinded by a light and it comes to him in a vision and God talks to him. And when he's talking to him he says all these things to him about what he's going to do, his purpose, his life and what these next few years are going to be like. And he converts him to Paul. And he becomes this man and he's going through all these things and now he's thrown in jail and he's going to be persecuted and murdered and killed because of his beliefs. And he gets a chance here with King Agrippa to stand before him and to prove his innocence and to tell the truth about who he is. I want you to listen to how beautiful his description of his faith and his purpose is to King Agrippa. And I want you to ask yourself, if you had to ask yourself right now what your purpose is, what your purpose is in life, would it sound anything like this? Starting in verse 1. It says, So Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and he made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews. Especially because you were familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation, and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. 
They have known for a long time that if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers. In Acts chapter 9, Paul's life changed. Paul went from living his earthly life and his earthly purpose to living out his calling while living out his life. He says, I lived up until this moment that they all know anyone that you ask would say Saul was a Pharisee. And then now, just some time later, he's standing on trial because of the hope and the promise made by God to our fathers. In verse 7, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. For this hope I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? You should think about the connection to the resurrection. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul has just described us whenever his purpose and his life were not together. It says that even when people were being put to death because of their belief in Christ, Paul cast his vote against them. Paul was a yea and an I'm in on let's kill them. Persecution and this time frame around Paul and then before that Saul was real, not subtle at all, persecution. People were murdered and killed for doing exactly what we are doing right now. People's lives were taken because they believed in Jesus Christ. I can recall a story a few years ago. This was back in my high school. I was probably ninth or 10th grade. Um, I was at 4th Street in Selmer here, and a man from Burma came back, a missionary, and spoke. And typically on these nights when a missionary would come, you know, it was a long speech about the report and the things they had done, and they're always encouraging. And... But this night it was very different. Um, the man was emotional, and he was... It had almost seemed like something drastic had happened in his life. But here's a man who was living out his calling while living out his life. His whole career, everything around him based upon missionary and God's work and spreading the good news to people in Burma. But what I didn't know at the time of what I know now is that in Burma it is mostly a Buddhist country and that to talk about Christianity or Jesus or the Bible in Burma is death penalty. That's what you receive. This man had just been on a mission trip. They had started a small home church um, with a few Christians there they were talking to and trying to convert to Christianity. And as they were talking, the missionary they had met there in Burma, who was uh, from the Burmese nation there, they talked with him. And and as they were kind of packing their stuff up after two weeks of being there and serving some time, they had to leave to come back to America for their safety. They had found that some of the military had been going home to home trying to find Christians. And this is not long ago, you guys. This is in the 2000s. This is not like first century. And as they were leaving, the missionary they met from Burma when they got there, and I just, like, this whole memory just sticks with me because I'll never forget what he said. He said, as we were walking to our airport, he said, we noticed when we got out of the car, we rode in two separate vehicles, but he came behind us to tell us goodbye. And when he told us goodbye, he began to cry. He said, and I thought, well, you know, it's not uncommon for someone to cry when they're going to hug you goodbye, to leave, to go to another country. But as that happened... The police and the military in Burma came and arrested him and put chains on him and took him away to be murdered because of his belief. This is in the mid-2000s. Living out your calling while living out your life. Paul was willing to put his life on the line for what he believed and the hope of the promise that had been made by God to our fathers. Are you willing, and we'll never probably have to do this in America, I hope, are you willing to put your life on the line for your purpose, to spread the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. He goes on in verse 12 and he says this, In this connection I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven. He's describing Acts chapter 9 to us. Brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? 
And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and in those in which I will deliver to you and appear to you. He just used the word purpose in his description to Paul of what he's saying to him. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you, Paul, as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. The first time Paul saw God and saw Jesus in this moment was in a bright light shown to him on the road to Damascus. I can only imagine how God testifies to him in this description here of the things that you have seen me and in the ways that I will appear to you. I can only imagine the things that Paul saw over the next few years of serving for Christ and the things that came true that he got to see God in time and time again. He says, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This is what I want you to think about here. Transformation plus purpose equals discipleship. We as disciples and Christians for Christ cannot create and make disciples until we become disciples ourselves. In full-fledged discipleship. When we are transformed by the renewal of our minds, Romans, we read about that often, when we are transformed, a transformation in our life, and we are baptized in these waters, and we give our lives to Christ, we are then accepting the purpose in Matthew chapter 28 from Jesus' resurrection of going to make disciples of all nations. But often, like I've said time and time again, often my lifely purpose here on earth, my earthly purpose and my eternal purpose do not align. Paul says, going on in verse 20, But I declared first to those in Damascus, that then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and they should turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me and the temple, and they tried to kill me. To this day I've, I had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. This is here. This is the last verse we're going to read of the morning. That the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to Gentiles. I want you to understand this, and this will be our last point for the morning. The crucifixion of Jesus saves us from the world, but the resurrection three days later is what gives us a purpose to live in it. When we accept Jesus on the cross, it's very easy to do to accept him. It is way easier to accept Jesus on the cross forgiving me of my sins because that's what's so great. It affects me personally. But three days later when the tomb and the stone was rolled back and the angel sat on it and talked to the two women in the front of them, shining like lightning, closed as white as snow, and he said, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus. And they chased him and they went and worshipped at his feet. And he said again, Do not be afraid. And then he came to the apostles, the 11 apostles, and he sat before them and he said, listen to me, all authority that is given to me on heaven and earth. And now you go and make disciples of all nations. When we become a Christian because we understand that Jesus is the Son of God and he gave his life on the cross for us and we put ourselves in the waters of baptism and we become a new person born again, we are transformed and we are given a purpose. We can accept Jesus on the cross pretty easily. It is much more difficult to accept him rising from the tomb three days later and doing something about it. That choice is ours. It's not like these 11 disciples went on and created thousands and thousands and thousands of disciples just because Jesus told them to. It was their choice and they had to make it. When we accept Jesus and the resurrection and we align our eternal purpose with our lifely purpose, our earthly purpose, when those two align, we begin to make disciples. So this morning I ask you this. Are you living out your calling while living out your life? It's very difficult for us to do that a lot of times, and especially in times like this. I feel like we wear that out every time we're in these doors about times like this. But I know it is. It's just reality. 
So this morning, I encourage you, my challenge to you is this. Um, tomorrow, when you go back to work, when those of you go back to school this next week, and it's going to be a horrible time, I'm sure, um, and I go back to work this week, and I've got students moving in, and you enter back into your lifestyle, whatever it might be, it's not to take this with you and to throw it on people. And if you want to do that, great. Go talk with them about the Bible. That's awesome. Um, but it's not to just take this and open it up in front of people and be like, you need to believe this. This is what you should be doing. But instead, it's to live out your calling while living out your life. It's so that when people see you, they see discipleship. And it makes them want to follow that same path that you're on. Because they see someone who is not just living an earthly purpose and occasionally an eternal purpose. But instead, it's someone who is living their life here on earth totally in line with their eternal glory and promise ahead of them. And I hope that someday, like Paul got to say to King Agrippa, I can say to Jesus as I go into heaven that, hey, I did this because I believed in the hope of the promise that was given to my fathers by God. And I hope that you'll do the same. As I travel through life with a struggle and strife, I'm a glorious one to get here on the way to my story.